So the idea is here to show how X-ray-based surface and interface uh, spectroscopy can help us to understand and improve solar cells, improve their efficiency. And um, first of all, I'd like to give the uh, outline of my talk. I'll quickly introduce my institute. I will uh, more or less skip the part about solar cells because we've heard enough about the functioning of solar cells already in this session. I'll introduce the Chalcopyra pin film solar cells and then come to the spectroscopic part and introduce XPS, our setup and the measurements we've done with certain systems at BESI in Berlin. And then I will talk a little bit about the outlooks of our new laboratory that we're planning in Berlin. So what's the Helmholtz Centrum Berlin? The Helmholtz Centrum Berlin is part of the Helmholtz Association. The Helmholtz Association in Germany is the largest research association that we have with uh, several centers scattered all over Germany. And uh, the Helmholtz Centrum Berlin is one of the medium-sized centers with about uh, 1,200 um, employees. It is located in two different parts of Berlin. So this is the outline of the German capital, Berlin. And uh, we have one campus in the southwest, the former Hahn Meitner Institute, which was founded in 1958. And this was founded to explore nuclear energy. So we have a nuclear reactor there on this campus here. And the second part of the Helmholtz Center in Berlin is a synchrotron. The uh, Berlin synchrotron source, a mid-sized synchrotron, an electron synchrotron for soft X-rays. And this is situated in the southeast of Berlin. And these two institutes were merged in 2009 to form the Helmholtz Centrum Berlin. So um, we know how a solar cell works. We have an absorbing material. We have doped these materials. Uh, for example, in silicon, we have N-doped silicon, we have P-doped silicon. So on one side, we have an electron surplus. On the other side, we have two little electrons. We bring those two together and there's an electric field between these two materials at the interface. And now we add two contacts, back contact, metal contact, and a front contact that is in some way transparent to light. So we have grid fingers, we have transparent material. And now we shine light on this. And what happens is we absorb light by exciting electrons from the lower part, from the valence band to the conduction band, and then due to the electric field, in the second step, the carriers are separated. So one part, the so-called hole, moves to this part of the solar cell, and the electron moves in this part of the solar cell. So the two charges are separated, and in the third step, they recombine somewhere through an external circuit, and that's where we get the power. We know, we've heard before, we have different types of solar cells, and I will focus on thin film solar cells, as opposed to crystalline silicon solar cell with a thickness of between 150 and 250 microns. In the case of thin film solar cells, we have much thinner layers. So these are only about two microns thick. Compare that to human hair with a thickness of 70 microns. So extremely thin layers. And that's what gives us some advantages over the crystalline silicon solar cell in that we can make them flexible, as you can see here, if we deposit the material on a foil. But also we need much less material, of course, and a much less expensive, high purity material in addition, we can use industrial coating techniques, like for coating glass, we can coat square meters of uh, glass in large machines. And in the end, this should give us some advantages 
of the wafer-based uh, crystalline silicon solar cell, which, of course, right now is still the majority of all solar cells made. So what does a chalcopyrite lymphome solar cell look like under the microscope? First of all, we have a molybdenum back electrode. And this is on a substrate that can be glass, it can be a flexible foil polyimide, it can also be uh, titanium or stainless steel. But the back molybdenum is important as a back electrode. And on this, we deposit a material that is composed of copper, indium, gallium, selenium, and sometimes also sulfur. And we call this material class chalcopyrite. And we often abbreviate it as CI3S or CI3SE. To complete the solar cell, we need a window layer. And this is the endo part of the solar cell, whereas the tracopyrite part is p-doped. So this is the interface where the action happens, where the charges are separated. However, you'll notice here that we have a very thin layer, which is invisible in this uh, graph of cadmium sulfide. This is what we call a buffer layer, and this is needed for high efficiency thin film solar cells, although we don't quite understand why it is needed. I mean, we do have the p-dope, we have the n doped here, so we should have a nice function there, but these are real materials. They form interfaces, there can be reactions at the interfaces, interdiffusion, and uh, we need the right energy lineup, and we need to line up the different lattices with different lattice spacing, so we need this buffer layer. And I will concentrate in, my, in parts of my talk on this buffer layer and on the understanding of the buffer layer of the surfaces and interfaces. Now, you've seen this chart several times today already. I will concentrate on this part because this green line is the efficiency of the, the CIGS solar cell. And you will notice, as you saw earlier in the last few graph, the efficiency of these cells right now is at 21.7%. So it's about the same as for crystalline silicon. Now, a different picture of the solar cell is given here, where we look at the energy of the electrons versus the thickness. So here, in this part, we have the actual absorber layer, the p-doped CI3S. And you will notice here, between the valence band and the, and the conduction band, there is a small band gap, that is, we absorb visible light. The band gap is about 1.1 electron volts. So this is where the light is absorbed. This, however, is the window layer, and it is called window layer because it's transparent. It's the endo part of our junction. In this case, it is N zinc oxide, could be aluminum doped or gallium doped. And because of the large band gap here, the light can penetrate through the window layer close to the junction, the PN junction, where the charges are separated. But then we also have this buffer layer here, which has an intermediate band gap. So we are losing a little bit of visible light here because this has a band gap of 2.4 electron volts. Cadmium sulfide is yellow, so we are losing part of the optical spectrum. So that's one reason why we try to replace this cadmium sulfide. Another reason, of course, is cadmium, as you know, is a toxic heavy metal. Now, you saw the efficiency chart, but here I'm showing the so-called Schockley-Quiser limit of a single junction solar cell. So this is the thermodynamic limit of the efficiency that we can achieve against the band gap. And you can see here, this is crystalline silicon, which is pretty close to its chocolate price limit already. This is CI3S, 
which is around 20%. And then cadmium telluride, amorphous silicon, is way below. And of course, we always have principal losses, and we've heard earlier what these losses are, why we can't get 100% efficiency. But in addition to those losses, we also have extra losses in the thin film modules, and these arrows show the module efficiency as opposed to the record cell efficiency here. And we have lots of disorders, we have brain boundaries, we have barriers, we have lots of problems that we're trying to solve to increase the efficiency. And this is especially true for thin film polycrystalline silicon. Um, trying to solve these problems, trying to understand what the problems are to improve these uh, thin film solar cells. And you heard earlier that one possibility, of course, are multi-junction uh, thin film solar cells. I'm going to talk about single junctions only. And uh, this chart shows you how the open circuit voltage, the VOC of a solar cell, of a thin film solar cell, based on charcoal pyrites, changes with the absorber band gap. Normally you would think if you increase the band gap, you should also increase the VOC linearly. However, you can see here that starting at a band gap of about 1.3, this curve levels out. And this is because probably, as I showed you earlier in this energy diagram, we need a band lineup of the conduction band. And this is just a, a representation again of this energy lineup. We have the valence band, we have the conduction band here, we have the window layer, we have the absorber. And depending on this lineup here, we can get a good VOC if this is aligned or we have a small spike like that. However, if we increase the band gap as we're doing it here of the absorber, you can see that the lineup is getting worse. We're getting what we call a cliff here. And this can cause a reduction of the VOC. So how do we measure this? How do we get this information? And this is what we are trying to do using light. Now, of course, light is electromagnetic radiation. We know that. And this ranges from the radio frequency, long wavelength, very low energies, up to the uh, gamma radiation. And with a synchrotron, we have a light source that provides us with light ranging from the IR to the X-ray region. And depending on the synchrotron that we're looking at, we have the so-called soft X-ray region here, we have the hard X-rays, here we have the UV light. And we're using a synchrotron, especially the uh, Bessie synchrotron in Berlin, as a light source for our analysis of solar cells, and we are using different types of spectroscopy. So for example, looking at a representation of an atom here, we have core levels, we have the valence band, we have electrons in these core levels. Now if we shine light, x-rays for example, on this atom, we can excite the electrons from the core level, and if we look at those electrons, we analyze them, we're calling this X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, or XPS. We can also look at the fluorescence light, and this then we call X-ray emission spectroscopy. And we can look at, at the transmission of the light, and then we call that X-ray absorption spectroscopy. And each of these methods gives us chemical information on the sample. We get structural information in many cases, and we get element-specific information, that is, we can use a certain wavelength, a certain energy of light to excite certain atoms in our sample and not the other one. So it's a very specific method. Now, I am going to talk about X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, XPS, and in a previous talk we just heard about the photoelectric effect. Of course, uh, this is the basis of photovoltaics, this is also the basis of XPS discovered by Heinrich Hertz, explained by Einstein. And what happens is we shine light on our electron, the electron is emitted, and then um, we can get recombination. So the electrons from higher shells close 
uh, fill this gap, this hole, and then we get a recombination, we get either emission of an, another electron to dissipate the energy, or of light, and then we call that X-ray fluorescence or X-ray emission. And we can use each of these processes for information about the model, about the system that we're looking at. For example, let's take a semiconductor zinc selenide, we irradiate it with X-rays, we get out electrons with different velocities, and of course these electrons originate from different shells in the atom with different binding energies. So if we shine monochromatic light with a given energy onto this atom, then we'll get electrons out that have a different kinetic energy, different velocity, because they originally had different binding energies. So we have to use a different amount of energy to get them out. And now we can analyze these electrons using a so-called hemispherical electron analyzer with an electric field between these two hemispheres. And by applying a different electric field, we can choose which electrons with which kinetic energy will hit the detector. And this, then we can evaluate, we can look at the kinetic energy, we know the excitation energy, H nu, and we can uh, determine the binding energy and the work function of the material when we measure the kinetic energy and we know the excitation energy. And what we get is a spectrum. Here we have the intensity, here we have the binding energy that we determine from the kinetic energy. And this is the spectrum of our semiconductor zinc selenide. And you can see we have various signals here and we attribute them to the different shells in the zinc and in the sulfur atom. So for example, from the zinc 3P level, selenium, sorry, selenium, selenium 3D and so on. So we can identify the material using this method. We get information on the elemental surface composition, the surface chemistry, and I'll also show you the electronic properties. Now, if we look at those peaks in detail, we can not only tell that we have a certain element, like sulfur here, this is from the sulfur 2P level, we can also tell the chemical environment, because we get a chemical shift of these peaks of the binding energy, depending on if the uh, atom is bound, for example, to oxygen, if it's bound to metal. So in this case here, we have sulfur bound to zinc as a sulfide, sulfur 2 minus, or sulfur in a sulfate, where sulfur is bound to oxygen. Because the electron density depends on the binding partner, on the electronegativity of the binding partner, the electronegativity of oxygen is much higher than that of zinc, which means that the electron is held by the electric field of the nucleus a little stronger than in this case. So we get a shift of the energies of the core levels, and that way we can identify from the shift the chemical environment of our species. One important feature of XPS is it's very surface sensitive. And this curve shows you the uh, so-called mean free path, that is the distance that the electron, once emitted from the atom, can travel in the solid before it hits some other electron, some is absorbed and loses energy. So this is the, the where the intensity is reduced to 1 over E. And you can see this is the electron energy here. Here we are at 10, here we are at 100. And this is lambda, the mean free path, in monolayers. So the minimum here is around two monolayers. So if you look at electrons with this energy, they will travel only two monolayers in your material, which means you're extremely surface sensitive. You see only the very surface of your material. This is a typical XPS machine, in fact the one that I use in my lab. We call it the SISI because uh, we're looking at CIS, CIS materials and we're using it at the synchrotron. And this is composed of various 
ultra high vacuum chambers, preparation chamber, analysis chamber, and this is the actual electron spectrometer that I showed you earlier where we analyze the kinetic energy. This is a photograph of that same machine. Here again, you see the analyzer. And this is a typical spectrum of a charcoal pyrite, copper, copper indium disulfide. And again, you see the typical peaks of indium, of copper, of sulfur. And now we deposit a thin layer of zinc oxide on top. And this is only one, uh, 0.3 nanometers of zinc oxide. And yet, we get some big extra peaks here from zinc. Because we're so surface sensitive, we see mainly the surface. And if we deposit, this is how to read, five nanometers of zinc oxide, we get the green spectrum, and we get only peaks from zinc and oxygen. We see only the zinc oxide, not the CI3S. Okay, now I'd like to show you how we use XPS to examine an alternative buffer layer where we replace the cadmium sulfide with a material containing only zinc, sulfur, and oxygen. Non-toxic, abundant. So here, in the normal configuration, at this point between the absorber and the window, we have cadmium sulfide. Replace that with zinc sulfide oxide. And uh, my colleague Ahmed Inawi, who talked yesterday, he has developed a process to deposit this material wet chemically. In our lab, we have a different process where we use physical methods, sputtering, to make the same uh, material. And here, well, this is hard to see. It's a very thin layer between the absorber and the window. And when you sputter this material, use the sputtering process, you can determine the composition, the ratio of oxygen to sulfur in this material. We have uh, the zinc sulfide on one end, and we can move all the way to zinc oxide by changing the ratio between sulfur and oxygen in the sputtering process. And if we look at the XPS spectra here, for the pure zinc oxide, we see zinc, of course, but we see no sulfur. For the pure zinc sulfide, we see sulfur and zinc but no oxygen, this insert is the oxygen signal. So using XPS, we can very precisely monitor the sputtering process of making the zinc sulfide oxide. So this is one thing. We can determine the elemental composition. Another thing is we're interested in the electronic states in the band uh, lineup that I showed you earlier. How do we do that? If we look at a XPS spectrum of the pure absorber, we get some core level peaks here, but we also get the valence band. We get, of course, the valence band is filled with electrons, so if we shine X-rays or even UV light on that sample, we can excite these electrons from the valence band. And so here, we can see where the maximum of the valence band is. And we can convert that into the band scheme that I showed you earlier. So we have here the valence band maximum of our window layer, and this is the absorber, and this is what we measure here. Now we coat this with the window layer, and we get a different valence band position here, and that's this one. And now from that, we can calculate this band offset. So that's what we did with uh, zinc sulfide oxide, and here you can see the shift of this valence band maximum, and in the end, using the optical band gap that we can measure of the material, we get the valence band and the conduction band edge of our buffer layer. And this is very important for the right lineup in our solar cell. This is basically the result of many, many measurements because we had to prepare all of these different materials and do all of these measurements. But it's very useful to optimize a solar cell. Second example I would like to show you is the use of high energy x-rays to examine the very surface of the absorber. This is our CI2S absorber and we know that the surface is very copper depleted. However, what we didn't know so far is the thickness 
of this surface layer. And uh, these are XPS measurements, the results of XPS measurements, copper concentration over indium concentration for different, differently prepared absorbers where the bulk concentration was changed between 0.6 and 1.1. That's the bulk concentration. That's this copper indium diselenide. And this on the y-axis is the surface concentration. And you can see that if we are copper poor, we have less copper than indium in there, ratio is below one, then the surface is always the same, has the same concentration of 0.3. If we get copper rich, however, the surface also gets very copper rich. And we know that this copper rich surface is a secondary phase, copper selenide, and uh, there was speculation about this copper poor surface phase, it was called uh, copper indium 3 selenium 5, and we looked at that with a method called a high energy photoelectron spectroscopy, and we used three different samples with three different bulk concentrations of 0 0.73, 0 0.85, and 1. And we just placed them here on this curve to show the kind of samples that we are using. And we were using high energy XPS at the synchrotron. And you can see this is again the universal curve showing the mean free path against the electron kinetic energy. If we go to higher energies, here we are at 5,000, we can penetrate further into the material. We're still fairly surface sensitive, but it's not absolute surface. It's more than a few monolayers. And these measurements here show you the ratio between the copper and the indium plus gallium, depending on the excitation energy, for the copper poor samples and for the stoichiometric sample. And you can see that as we go from low energies, 2,000 to higher energies, the uh, copper to indium ratio goes up and levels out here. It levels out at the same value that we know from the preparation is the value of the volume. And uh, this is not a depth profile yet. These are just measurements, just ratios of copper to indium. But we can model this, and from the model we can get a depth profile. And this depth profile was quite surprising, because if we want to model this correctly, we come out with a very copper depleted surface layer, which has no copper in the surface in a thickness of 0.6 0.8 nanometers. So extremely thin, looks like there's no copper on the surface, and this is quite important for modeling of these solar cells. This had not been known previously. And this is just one example of how we can use high energy synchrotron radiation to examine these surfaces. And we're going to develop this further. So far, we had our machine that we had to move to one of the beam lines of the Bessie 2 synchrotron. In the future, we'll have our own laboratory. Um, at that time when we made this drawing, it was called Sissy, but now we changed the name to Emil. Emil is the energy materials in situ lab at Bessie. It has its own building, and the building is almost complete now, and will ho hopefully start the first experiments at the end of next year when we have all the equipment in there. And the equipment will be quite advanced. We'll have two beam lines going into that building, one for soft, one for hard x-rays. And connected to that, we'll have the analysis chambers. And connected to those, we'll have various clusters of chambers to make in-system photovoltaic materials like silicon, like charcoal pyrites, like perovskites, like nanomaterials. And this will give us the opportunity to make layer stacks of all these materials and move them in vacuum to those analysis setups so we don't have to transport them through air, avoiding contamination, avoiding oxidation, and all that. So to conclude, I hope I could show you that uh, using surface-sensitive photoemission spectroscopy where it can characterize surfaces and interfaces in thin-film solar cells.
and that this can help us to improve, to better understand and improve these devices. And in the future, the email laboratory will even optimize and improve these methods. And I would like to acknowledge my group, of course, because those are the guys who did the measurements. And of course, also the Bessie staff, the Synchrotron people do an amazing work of keeping this huge thing running and helping us, supporting us uh, do our measurements. Our institute director, Professor Luke Steiner, for her support, and of course, financial support by national governments and the European Union. And with that, I'd like to thank, to think, to stop. Thank you.